The Moravians were people who lived in Central Europe in the province of Austria, better known as Bohemia and Moravia. It's, it's a wonderful story how they happened to be here. The Moravians were an ancient Protestant denomination that actually began and preceded Martin Luther by about 102 years. Jan Hus, who was burned at the stake by the Catholic Council of Constance in 1415, was the beginning of the Unitas Fratrum. By the time Martin Luther came along, there were already 200,000 members of the Unitas Fratrum throughout Bohemia and modern-day Poland primarily. Ferdinand was king and he forced anyone who was not a Catholic to flee from the land. John Amos Comenius, the great educator of Europe at that time, made arrangements for them to flee to Poland. As they eventually, after the Battle of White Mountain in 1620, left Bohemia, came over the Moravian Mountains into adjacent Moravia. Bohemia and Moravia were right next to each other and landed on the estates of Count Nicholas von Zindendorf in Saxony. He met the <clears throat> General Oglethorpe, who was also a student and they became very close friends. And Oglethorpe, you remember later, became the governor of Georgia. They really wanted to get spread the word of the gospel in the New World. And everyone was going to the New World, so why not the Moravians as well? And they originally landed in Georgia. Didn't go so well. A little clash with the Methodists and the Indians down there, the Native Americans. So they decided to come up the Great Wagon Road up to Philadelphia. The old Native American footpaths quickly became taken over by the white settlers as their main thoroughfare. So that got them to Pennsylvania quickly. And about 12 of the family settlers went to Pennsylvania and helped to build Bethlehem. The Germans always did it all themselves, which is why they were quickly founded such successful little trading post communities in Pennsylvania and all up and down North Carolina, because they weren't, they weren't afraid of hard work, never have been. Germanic. Lord Granville offered them the opportunity to bring a settlement to Carolina. They bought the land from uh, some king in England. Yeah, they bought 100,000 acres. And he told them they could pick it out anywhere between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. He, he owned a 100-mile strip all the way through the United States at that time. Yeah, that's the way they chopped it up back then, you know, because they didn't realize what a big country this was. Bishop Spangenberg and Christian Reuter, the famous surveyor, would have come down from Pennsylvania to survey their new holdings in North Carolina. So they were sent down on a preliminary mission to do that, established Bethabara as a temporary settlement, and then the plan was to go Bethania, which was right. They had already decided where everything was going to go in a little triad. Bethabara, Bethania, and then there's a straight shot, as you know. Rinalda Road is the original Moravian Road cut straight to Old Salem. And Salem was always going to be the central town. Bethabara was formed in 1753 by 15 single unmarried men coming from Pennsylvania and from Europe. And they were specifically coming here to uh, really look ahead to build all of the communities of Wachovia. And therefore, Bethabara was really just a temporary organizational settlement for the first few years. The official move ended to Salem in 1772. Salem was the administrative center. And after that, Bethabara really became a sleepy farm community, a sister settlement to Bethania, which was the first planned uh, full-scale Moravian settlement in North Carolina. The basic belief of the Moravian, I would say, is that he acknowledges the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And becoming a Christian, his greatest desire is to win other people to Christ. And basically the essentials boil down to um, Christ as the Savior and you know some of the basic actually Christian doctrine uh, essentials. 
And then everything else, we don't need to argue about it. We'll have liberty, and that's for you to work out. And, um, and they don't judge you for having a difference of opinion or, or uh, a voice. It's nice. The Moravians uh, considered their church family, their faith family, superior to that of their earthly family. Now, they loved their brothers and sisters and their parents and so forth, but they had a social system in every Moravian community, it was in existence here in Bethania, called the choir system. In this case, it has nothing to do with music, but it's a way of taking the larger congregation and breaking it down into smaller groups, peer support groups, essentially. These are determined by age, gender, and marital status. So basically, that determines where you sat at worship in the sanctuary. That was the group of peers you grew up with and uh, you confided in when you needed uh, to talk to somebody. They helped you to grow spiritually, but in, in eternal life, in death, you are buried by choir. So in the Moravian church, a husband and wife are not buried together. Rather, you are buried by choir. All married men are buried on one side of the graveyard, all married women. All single brothers, single sisters, little boys, little girls. It occurred to me the other day, the magnitude of uh, the seriousness in which the Moravians really do embrace community. When, it, when, it, when I realized that our friends at that church and I are going to be buried together. Mrs. Cat and I will be, I mean, what an honor. I feel honored. The single brother, the, sing, the choir system was all um, Zinzendorf's idea. This was not something that had come from the unitus fratrum, which means unity of brethren in Latin. This is not something that Jan Hus and the Hussites had instigated. But I, I might want to take that back because they were living in apostolic villages of the Lord in the 15th century. That's how it all began. There was not supposed to be any differences of class just because you happen to have been born into a wealthier family in Jesus' eyes and in the early Unitas Fratrum's eyes, everybody was the same. There was no hierarchy. They valued that throughout their culture. All these years, they have actually valued where you are in your walk, in your spiritual walk, in your life, and then when you die, you're buried with these people that you've been with every day or I mean, it's very special. The strongest traditions are still heavily in place. We have the love feast, the Moravian daily text. We're still all over the globe proselytizing as missionaries. There are more Moravians in Africa and always have been than there have been in North America. One of their sayings is, in the essentials, unity, in the non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, love. And when I heard that and I started to get to know the people who were associating themselves with the Moravian Church, I really found that that was the truth. They, in every situation I've encountered in the Moravian Church, dealing with Moravians, that is what they embody. Count Zinzendorf had had a problem in Prussia where he, there was one of the Moravian villages where they let non-brethren move into the village. And it had been a big problem. And, and he had really, it left a real bad taste in his mouth. Well, word came from the U.S. Well, the U.S., nothing from the, from, from the colonies, that Bethania had been founded and they were allowing non-brethren and brethren to live in the same town. And it's right there in the archives that Count Zinzendorf took a conniption fit went to bed and died a week later. <laughs> so, so it's right there in the archives. And I may not have gotten that story exactly right, but, but I was down there and the guy said, oh, the town that killed Count Zinzendorf. When Spongenberg went back to Europe and told him that the lower half of Bethania was settled by communicant Moravians, the upper half was settled by persons who desired to become Moravians, but were not at that time. He thought that establishing a town, mixing the two, 
was a very bad idea, and he died within six days. <laughs>